uh, and that's recorded part. <laughs> and so uh, I have uh, we have a great a set of panelists on board to speak about quantum computing. The the uh, and so I would like to uh, introduce um, uh, Denise Ruffner, who's a dear friend of mine, and she is the uh, chief business officer at uh, Adam Computing. Uh, uh, she's a, a company that was obsessed, obsessed with the building the world's most scalable quantum computers out of optically trapped neutral, neutral atoms. So Denise. Oh, thank you, Eddie. And uh, very funny, I'm in a hotel room and the maid is knocking on the door. So um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have a little background disturbance but really excited to be here this year. There was great response last year, which was very um, welcome uh, when we focused on cryptography. And this year, what we've decided to do is to focus more broadly on quantum computing. And so what we've done is we have uh, the leader in quantum cryptography, Crypt, and I'll have Dennis introduce himself in a minute, as well as the leading, the leading quantum software company, Zapata, with Christopher Savoy, who will introduce himself soon, as well as Reed, um, a very big investor out of MIT. So I think we're gonna have a very interesting discussion tonight about uh, quantum cryptography, a little bit from me about hardware, Reed giving us an overview of quantum computing, and then Christopher, of course, talking about all the great work um, that's being done in software. So why don't we start with introductions and I'll have you each introduce yourself and we'll start with Dennis. Thanks, Denise. Uh, my name is Dennis Mandich. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Crypt. We're a post-quantum cryptography company. We build hardware and software-based systems to secure any infrastructure from OT to IT to applications against the attacks that are available that are coming from quantum computers. Excellent. And Christopher? Hi, Christopher Savoy. I'm the uh, co-founder and, and CEO of Zapata Computing. Um, we are a Harvard spin-out, interestingly. I think we may have been, Riedel, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the first Harvard uh, spin-outs to be funded by the in, initially MIT um, uh, LP uh, fund at the engine. Um, so that was kind of interesting uh, uh, first. Uh, that we had. So we come out of the lab of uh, Alana Sparagushik, who some of you may know in this field, uh, as uh, one of the really key algorithmic developers in this field. And uh, in his lab, the first algorithm to run on any quantum computer anywhere, VQE, Variational Quantum Eigen Solver, was developed by him in his lab. Um, so uh, we, uh, that's, that's who we are. And uh, we uh, have over, over 30 PhD level um, scientists uh, doing algorithm development, and then you have another 30 or so people doing the software engineering uh, behind how you actually make this stuff work in practice uh, at the company. And we're 90 people globally. Thank you. And that company is Zapata Computing. Um, Reed, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Reed Sturdivant. I'm uh, one of the general partners at the Engine, which is a Venture MIT created, but we're an independent public, uh, uh, sorry, separate for profit company. Uh, we have a set of venture funds. Uh, we just had our fifth birthday. Uh, we also run specialized co working space with chemistry, biology, labs, uh, machine shop, and, and uh, look to invest very, very early seed stage in uh, science and technology based companies that when they succeed, we'll make the world a better place. So we've, we've made about 40 investments um, across all kinds of industries in the last five years. Great, thank you. And as I promised, I wanted to start off and talk a little bit about what's changed over the past year. And so I thought the best person to start off to do this is Christopher Savoy. And uh, Zapata was focused in 27, or founded in 2017 and uh, works on developing software for quantum computers. So Christopher, can you talk to us a little bit about how the quantum hardware and software market has changed since the pot has started? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, when we started, so, you know, we initially spun out of Juan's lab. Uh, we started uh, that in the, we were founded in 2017 at, in November, and then actually got out going operationally uh, the beginning of 2018. Uh, at the time, there really weren't any pure software companies. There was no independent software vendor that we knew of. Maybe there were others out there that we weren't aware of, but um, there were companies like Rigetti, uh, like IBM, uh, where you were, uh, who were doing some of the software, but as part of the hardware um, uh, stack, in, in a way, it was kind of an add-on. Uh, there were some libraries, there were some Python libraries to go interact with these machines, but um, they were kind of few and far between, and nobody really had a um, if you will, a real full stack of uh, software there. And there was a there was an area where we saw an opportunity to go in there and actually do real software engineering um, because you, you're not going to create a, uh, a, a, a real solution for a big company that's really interested in doing this for real um, with a few Python, Python libraries and a bunch of low level down to the metal code. That's just not 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 going to be pragmatic in today's day and age in high performance computing, which is really what this is all about. Um, so at the time, there was nothing. There were no real tools except for a few disparate Python uh, th uh, things. You know, Kiskit was out there, Circ was out there, uh, Forest for, for Rigetti, but they were really low level. And literally when we moved into the engine in our one room with the brick walls and everything, literally five people stuffed in one little little room with a, with a, with a blackboard, we were literally writing the circuits on a blackboard, right? And literally transposing them into uh, uh, paper and sending the circuit to Rigetti, okay? That was the software interface. The API was a person at Rigetti who would then, okay, you know, basically um, type it into, they had some low level uh, APIs, if you want to call them APIs, some Python access, Will Zhang over there would type it in or one, someone on his team. Uh, would actually, you know, then run it. And then we would get results. And the results were, you know, thankfully in a CSV file. But even that was done over email. Um, so there really wasn't any software to speak of. You know, there really wasn't any real cloud access for people working on these machines. IBM did have the Q experience and that kind of thing. Um, fast forward to today. And we do have, uh, thankfully, some pretty good cloud access to this. Um, so the current state of the art is that you can, you know, use a, 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 an instruction language uh, like Chasm, uh, this low level language, and, and, and say, here's my circuit and describe it in, 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 in Python or, or a file and send it over the cloud through Amazon or sometimes directly to um, one, of the, one of the company's APIs and run the circuit, right? Um, and some folks have developed some tools that allow you to even draw the circuit, um, you know, visually, um, and then, you know, turn that into VS code and then send something, you know, uh, as, as a workflow in there. Um, and that's gotten better. Now, our system, uh, that we have now, uh, is a lot more sophisticated than that. Uh, we have like workflow descriptions, uh, that we have in a fully UI, uh, VS code thing that works on multiple clouds. Uh, so you can have your data on one cloud and your classical compute that you would do on a different cloud, and then you execute part of the workflow on your high performance computing system that's on prem uh, on a different cluster, and then the piece that's quantum goes to IBM or maybe in parallel to IBM and IonQ and Atom, and 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 then you know send the results back, collate them, and put that all up uh, into a, a unified interface, which is our orchestra system that we use. Uh, and we're using that in the context of all of our customer uh, interactions and in the context of uh, the DoD project that we're doing to benchmark. So we can send uh, multiple jobs out there on multiple clouds, collate all of that, and, and basically do what we're doing in a really good DSML uh, platform for workflows, which is way different from doing it by hand and writing. So, you know, just in four years, really, um, uh, blink of the eye. Uh, where, where we've gone from, you know, literally writing things on paper to uh, a modern cloud, multi-cloud uh, based stack with all the Kubernetes orchestration and all of that kind of thing. So on the software side, that, that, that's what's happened. I would go to the, the hardware side and say that, you know, when we started, you know, there was no supremacy experiment by Google. There were maybe 10 working qubits that kind of sucked, to be honest. Uh, they, they were, you know, about 
some, most of the time 80% fidelity. People were claiming 90, 90 something percent, 99 percent. But the reality at the time really was, we kind of knew the reality, was that that's the champion data. That was, okay, we could do it one time for one hour, and then, okay, all bets are off. And that really wasn't the stable state. Now, fast forward to today, and we're getting uh, really good um, fidelity numbers, 99.9. .9. Okay, it's not enough yet to have full error correction or fault tolerance or whatever, but it's a world of difference from four years ago. And we're seeing that to start now that we've got more and more engineers, more money going into higher engineers into this as opposed to experimental physicists. Um, I'm seeing you know a lot of acceleration in roadmaps to the point where people are not only hitting their roadmap goals, they're um, improving on them and, and and kind of accelerating the pace of the number of qubits and the quality of qubits that we have. Just a th three weeks ago or four weeks ago, we had uh, um, both ion trap folks who are using a different um, ion. Uh, switch to barium. And within two hours, I saw on my Twitter feed, oh, wow, we've got the most champion data in the world. And here's our paper. And then two hours later, well, we just beat you. Um, uh, so, so there's really this competition uh, heating up. And, and it really is a cat and dog thing, whether it's in ions or superconducting or whatever happening on the hardware um, space. Having said that, are we at a place where we're you know, fully available, fully uh, robust, uh, fully calibrated error corrected qubits yet? No, we're not there yet. Um, but the optimism I have is, you know, looking at things from four years ago uh, and wondering, I think reading us in the border, like, will this really happen? I mean, it's a bet. We think it will, was really the kind of thinking, I think, in our boardroom. Um, we, we hope it will, but there's, you know, 80% eh, right. And that's the risk capital at the time. Now, I don't think it's a question of, if it really is a question of when. And I, I'd say that with full confidence. And there are other modalities that have come on board. Recently, we had some really good stuff from Jason Pettis group in, in silicon qubits and other groups in silicon qubits and, and other you know, modalities that make this look like it really is going to scale. We still don't know which, which of these platforms and architectures is gonna be the ultimate winner. Maybe there will be several. Um, but I think that we're now at a point where we can say with pretty, a pretty high level of confidence at some point in the next 10 years, we're going to have, you know, close to fault tolerant or at least strongly mitigated or mitigated systems that will be capable of doing some pretty amazing things. There's a very little question, I think, in, in, in at least the conventional wisdom that that's the case now. And that's not the way it was uh, four years ago. There, you know, when you're writing paper on software for computers that are only 80% right, meaning, you know, one fifth of the time they're wrong about whether it's a zero or a one, um, that, that, that that's a far step away from, oh, we're going to revolutionize computers. We hope that might happen, but hope's not a business plan. I think now, uh, you know, luckily for the people who took the risk, there are leaders in this who've been doing this now for four years. Um, and I think that that started to differentiate. Um, I think the other difference is that it makes it harder, I think, for new entrants to really claim that they're going to do better than the folks who have been doing it for four years or five years. So I think that there's a little bit we've seen consolidation starting to happen. Uh, in the industry, some M&A activity and, and, and winners and losers starting to kind of emerge from that. So that, that's my um, lots of word salad um, introduction to it. Thanks, Christopher. And yeah, a lot has changed in a very short period of time. And I think it's always amazing day to day, like when we had the spam announcement two hours apart, it's just crazy how quickly things are happening. Um, I wanted to also talk about cybersecurity since that was such a big topic last year. And in the past year, I feel like Crypt has really emerged out of, as the leader. And so Dennis, uh, Crypt is in New York and you have a beautiful picture behind you. Uh, you started, I believe in 2018. And maybe you can talk a little bit more about what you do and how the market has changed since you started the company. Thanks, Denise. Yeah. Part of the reason why we started Crypt is the founders and I were all from the intelligence community. And in the 2010s, we saw massive amounts of data being collected from overseas uh, nation state collection, where the amount of IP that was being stolen from the US was the largest transfer of wealth in human history. And we didn't know if it was sustainable. And one of the things we realized is that 
if much of that data had been encrypted with classical encryption systems, at least there would have been some protections on it. But around 2015, 2016, NSA deprecated research and started funding new research into post-quantum crypto, which would be very difficult for all these older applications and software platforms to be able to even implement. That's why we founded Crypt, because we really felt like this was a national economic security issue. If we could just encrypt a lot of this data, use strong encryption that was at least somewhat resistant to quantum computers, we'd be safe for a long time. Um, the concept of capturing data in flight from data centers and big fiber pipes around the world is you know, as old as the Cold War. This uh, was called Harvest Now, Decrypt Later for many generations. It goes back to the Venona project where we captured Russian communications and found flaws in their encryption mechanism were the thing that made their keys and were able to decrypt and read all their traffic. The big difference in the 2010s was that now this foreign entity was capturing a lot of encrypted data. In fact, going into companies and targeting that encrypted data for no good reason, because that's a high risk operation. You would normally in a typical hack go after the stuff that's unencrypted because you can immediately operationalize that and probably monetize it. Whereas here, they're playing the long game. This is capturing the data that's the most important that could potentially change an entire industry uh, five, 10, or even 20 years from now when the large scale quantum systems come online. And so the thing that really changed just in the last few years is the NIST competition is now reaching its end and the new standards for which any compliance industry, whether it's healthcare or finance, will have to comply is now here. We thought it was gonna happen a couple of weeks ago, but it hasn't happened yet. But either way, any company that's thinking of developing any type of software or looking at long-term platform investments, whether it's in hardware or software or cloud systems, they have to incorporate this today. And transitioning from these older systems, people realize it's not flipping a switch. It's gonna be a long, painful process for most companies, especially for a large enterprise. That's gonna take about five years the um, problem now going back to the 1970s is we bet all of the internet and global economic communication security on just a couple of algorithms. Um, and these are known to be broken by quantum computers. Mm -hmm. Actually, mm -hmm. Sorry, let me say something. I thought somebody interrupted. And now uh, us as a global economy, relying on just a handful of older algorithms many of which were broken before quantum computers through classical means, not by brute force, by other mechanisms. Uh, we need to solve those problems. And at the very foundational layer of all crypto is step one. You have to be able to generate a random number. And we've just seen some of the biggest breaks uh, ever in uh, cybersecurity from companies like Samsung, where 100 million cell phones, the security of them and their crypto is compromised by simple implementation error in that first step of generating that random number to make keys. So we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we've worked with the national labs to find the best hardware mechanism that the government has enjoyed for many years at great expense and make that really accessible to a large industry through our cloud platform. Just generate a quantum entropy source that produces random numbers that you can securely access from the And you've overcome a lot of those entry barriers to doing something that's post-quantum because now the key sizes have exploded where orders of magnitude bigger, lots more computational resources are required to implement these algorithms and software today. So that's a long answer to, uh, we're transitioning to a new era in this post-quantum era for cybersecurity, which is effectively the defensive end of what quantum computers can do. Is, you know, going back in history, any big development in quantum, you know, the nuclear weapons or anything else was used for offensive purposes before it was used for curing cancer. Dennis, if you could just repeat again what's happening at NIST. I just want to make sure everybody in the audience understands the competition that's been going on. Um, so it, yeah, in so 2015, 2016, NIST started a new competition to replace the older algorithms like um, RSA and elliptical curves that we've been relying on. NSA deprecated and defunded all research into elliptical curves, surprisingly, without noticed and consulting with the community, uh, which was a, a big sign to everyone that we should prepare immediately. 
Uh, we started out with over 80 algorithms for doing key exchange and digital signatures, which is what the entire internet relies on today. And we're down to just a handful. Uh, most of those have fallen for performance or weaknesses have been found. And we now have a diversity, not just one single basic algorithm to use for this future generation of crypto. That will, was supposed to be released at the end of March. It will be finalized in 2024. We'll have a two year period where these will be evaluated in real world use cases. And then this will say these are the last two or three that will be certified and everybody will be re required to convert to them in the coming years. And that could happen any day now. We, we expected it at the end of March, but it'll probably happen in April sometime. All right, thank you. And I also wanna mention, I have, I've seen a question in the chat and I uh, wanna get through a couple of questions, but we certainly will come back to the audience's questions. So if you have more questions and wanna put them in chat, we'll get to them. Um, but next I wanted to talk to Reed and have Reed talk a little bit about his work as general partner at the engine. Um, where they're looking for tough tech type opportunities. So what is a tough tech type opportunity? And if you could tell us a little bit about your quantum investments and uh, what you all are doing there. First I'll unmute. <laughs> the, uh, two years in, I still don't know how to use Zoom. The, the, um, the tough tech is, is meant to just be a uh, easy to remember and easy to pass along. It, we think of it as things that are very hard and, and things that are durable. So, so things that could be very, very uh, big as a, as a business or things that could create an industry or multiple industries. So, you know, we have made investments into things as broad reaching as commercial uh, fusion power, which um, is something with very little product market risk, product market fit questions. If you can make it cheap enough, people buy electricity. So it's, if we look for things that, that have, can have quite a bit of timeline risk and a fair amount of technical risk, but very little market risk uh, is, our, is our preference. They're not, not always like that. Um, as an investor, as a, literally a seed stage investor, we invested full disclosure into Zapata um, at the very early days. Um, the uncertain timeline means that, that our fund has to have a certain structure. So unlike most venture funds um, in the US, our funds can have up to an 18 year fund life. That gives us the, the alignment from our limited partners that things don't have to exit and pay back in, in the usual you know, seven, eight, 10 years timeframe. Um, we, um, we looked at quite a few, uh, I'd say maybe eight or 10 pure play quantum computing hardware uh, projects over the last, the engine is five years old. Um, so over the last five years, um, we just, we haven't announced it yet, but we just last week, we, we signed our first term sheet for a full stack um, quantum computing hardware project. Um, but when we met Christopher's team, the talent and the fact that it was a uh, hardware agnostic uh, play in software really was attractive to us because it, it, even though the timeline was uncertain, Christopher, what you just said, you know, it's like, yep, everybody's like, it's not if, it's when. And the big companies realize that this, in many ways, will either help them or hurt them. And, and they, they need, it'll take time for them to get ready and understand it. and and. Uh, that has created a near-term market um, for, for the consulting and education and, and, and deep partnership with some of these large enterprises. Um, on the hardware side, to be honest, we, we, we still think if this were digital computers, it's, it's somewhere in, the, in that second half of the 1950s. Um, we, lo we look at a, a lot of things that are not great fit for the engine, which are sort of a, a piece of the full system. It's like, oh, we've invented this control system. Um, oh, we've invested, invented a way to network multiple cold volumes for superconducting things. Um, we, you know, but it, those component parts, it's almost like if you look back at some of the, the, it's like, hey, how do we 
make memory, digital memory? Should we use this goofy mercury delay line? Should we weave ferrite rings onto all of these wires? You know, it's 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 early days, uh, and um, it's not necessarily clear as an investor that the early architectural decisions will survive you know, over the next couple of decades. Um, so we are still looking at very young teams coming out of university who have, um, have the belief that, hey, I know that these large, you know, well-funded teams out of very strong technical organizations, the IBMs, Googles, Microsofts, Honeywells of the world, let alone the startups um, uh, like Adam and INQ. And, and, and we know they, they have a couple decade head start, some of them, but that doesn't mean that their architecture, if you, if you actually, you can still poke a lot of holes in some of them. Um, okay, million qubits, how are you gonna get those microwave, you know, waveguides to fit into, you know, without bringing heat in on the, along the way, you know, there's got to be a different approach, you know, so, so we're quite optimistic about the ability of new technical approaches to, to, to win, even against well-funded entrenched um, competitors. Um, if anybody reads, you know, techno economic history, like Carlotta Perez, or there's this repeating pattern of, of, um, a technical breakthrough or an engineering breakthrough, creating this rush of speculative finance and, and, and the, the, the um, over financing, whether it's railroads, canals, telegraph, internet, is just a natural, that wasteful investment wave uh, and the, the bubbles that can't support that many companies that collapse still leave you with this golden age of, of new capability for all kinds of new businesses to be built. So it's just capitalism by nature around technical innovation is, is a very almost deliberately wasteful process that, that has to, has to, you have to come through. We, we definitely feel the quantum hardware world is, is kind of in that frothy, but not in a pejorative way, uh, uh, era still. Great. And actually, I love that you call the wasteful investment wave or bubbles, and that's that's very interesting terminology. Um, I know over the past year, there's been a lot of talk about um, companies going public and all sorts of revenue opportunities for quantum. I heard a company talk that they would be two to four billion in, I think, two or three years. And uh, Christopher, how do you see the quantum computing market, both for hardware and software, growing um, in the next couple of years in terms of revenue? Sure. I mean, if it we we uh, we're not going to make any projections here, and we don't make projections. Uh, but uh, um, what what we can I think say is that there's going to be a TAM that's everyone agrees uh, a total you know available market that that's large, right? Um, and uh, I don't think there's a lot of questions. So it's, you know, it's a reach point. It's, a, it's kind of like, okay, it, it, will there be a product market fit? If you can do these kind of uh, calculations, will people buy it? Clearly, that's why you, know, you see not only uh, at, in the QEDC that, that, that we're a member of and 150 other companies are, you see not only quantum computing startups there are, or big quantum computing companies, you see user groups, like user companies like Boeing and, and chemical companies and these kind of people uh, participating. In our own company, we have BSF, Robert Bosch, Comcast, Universal NBC investing in our company. So uh, I think that there's not a lot of question of if you could do this, would it be valuable, right? So what, do, what number do you put on that five years from now when you can do it? It's kind of like, okay, we're, you know, we're in BitNet world and the internet's coming. And the people who can see it, see it. And those initial companies like Netscape or whatever were asked, what are your projections? Now, did, 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 did uh, the folks who invested in, uh, like Kleiner investing in Netscape, right? And Mark Andreessen's company really know what that number was? And did, did you know, Mark know what that was coming out of the University of Michigan? I think the answer is probably not, but he had to come up with some A round business plan that said it's a big number. And I, who knows, it was a gazillion dollars. Right. And I think we're kind of in that phase right now. Nobody can possibly know whether it's two trillion dollars or three trillion dollars or half a trillion dollars or or, or what that is. Right. Uh, I think that we're at a point where, OK, 
uh, when this happens, it's going to be probably additive to what last year in 2021, computing hardware infrastructure was a $1 trillion business. And software and services around that were, was a $3 trillion business. So $4 trillion to go around for everybody. Okay. Now, quantum computing, if that takes it to a different level, how will it be consumed? Will it be more hardware than software, more software than hardware. I think our thesis is that, you know, it's going to be kind of the same, right? Uh, I, I think it's going to, the ratios not, are not likely to change in history. They haven't, you know, whether it's been, you know, mainframe to, you know, server client to, to cloud, you know, cloud compute, it's kind of stayed the same overall ratio, even when you've added new technologies like big data, cloud, AI, whatever, right? Um, so I think that that ratio is not likely to change a lot, which is why, you know, us as, you know, selfish software people, uh, we think that's a very good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, the how, how what that actual absolute number is going to be, I don't think anyone can really with a straight face tell you what it is, except that it's going to be large. It's just, this is going to fundamentally give it another step change in what things that we can do. So let me also say that, you know, there are two categories of things we can do with quantum computers eventually, right? One is we can improve what we're already doing. Like you know, the use cases we already know about, right? Uh, even gaming is gonna improve, you know, using quantum computers, you know, um, that's, that's gonna get better, you know, uh, VR and things that we can dream of, right? Uh, that, that kind of category of things. So making supercomputing simulations of airplane uh, fluid dynamics over a wing and the kind of stuff we need to do now and that consumes a lot of HPC, maybe uh, mining crypto, uh, stuff that we can conceive of that if you had better ways to do mathematics quickly or better ways to do machine learning uh, quickly um, and better, that that is going to be part of the quantum computing market. Right, so it's going to be concentric and part of growing this already existing computing market. So it's going to be increasing and maybe consuming, cannibalizing some of that four trillion dollars. In addition, though, there are going to be other areas. Uh, you know, if we're looking out to fault tolerance, whenever that's going to happen, ten years, five years, fifteen years, take you know, take your pick. You know, fortunately, we have investors that we've intentionally worked with who have a longer time frame that, that says, well, we don't really care because if it's 12 years from now, uh, we win. If it's seven years from now, we win. Um, uh, and I think big companies that have a longer view also are feeling that way. But those kind of problems that are going to happen in that fault tolerant regime uh, aren't just added. They're doing things that we can't even possibly even conceive of what, what those things are going to be. Um, because there are going to be a, a completely new form of uh, algorithms like Shor's algorithm and other things that do stuff we cannot do today unless we add until the end of time to do them just because of the way that we calculate here. And, and to me, that's kind of the exciting thing here from a revenue perspective is when we hit that inflection point. And I think what you're seeing, at least in the big picture here, right? Revenue is writ large for quantum computing when we hit that fault tolerance thing. The, the message is, the point isn't, is that going to happen in 2026? Okay. Are, 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 were INQ's projections correct? Was it, I mean, it might be 2025, it might be 2028. Um, when that happens, is that a large number? And is that going to, you know, create these two markets, you know, the additive, what we can do in, in, uh, to, to increase a $4 trillion market, and then add maybe another $4 trillion in things like materials development and all of this other stuff. The other thing to understand here is that some of the stuff we're talking about is being able to get that new drug, being able to get that new material. And it's so that secondary economic effect that's gonna happen here, kind of like the internet. Uh, the internet itself and the infrastructure and you know selling Cisco routers really isn't the market if you wanna talk about the market. It's Amazon, right? It's transforming our economy completely. And I think that that is the real opportunity that a lot of people are getting excited on, about. And it's not really even in that $4 trillion becoming $8 trillion. Uh, uh, it, it's about, okay, if I could do this, I know I have a drug that's worth curing cancer worldwide, okay? Uh, what's that worth? Trillions, you know, uh, potentially. So I, I, that's a long way of saying that um, the revenue opportunity is there. It's probably longer term. Uh, and then let me back up to say that there's revenue opportunity now uh, in preparing for that, in creating infrastructure that will run these things. 
because big data right now is not solved. And this is big data plus big compute, which is certainly not solved. And so there's a real opportunity today to help companies build that infrastructure that is going to be necessary once that light turns on. And I don't think it's a light that, that's a switch. It's not a step function. It's more like a dimmer switch that's accelerating. And, uh, and so the opportunity is today. Um, if we go back in history, you were talking about kind of the different histories. I kind of like to think about this uh, not as 1950, but more like the mid 70s, Altair. Right now it's hobbyists. And you know, if you look back in 1976, I was looking at like, what was the big algorithm for the Altair computer in the magazines that you wrote your basic programs or C programs out of uh, back in the day. And uh, the big algorithm in 1976 was drawing a graph of two variables, X and Y, drawing a line. You, you could already do that on a mainframe and you could do it better and faster, but it was a hobbyist thing, right? And so, but eventually the microcomputers caught up and now the microcomputers are the supercomputers. So, and, and the software and all the hardware, blah, 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 who could have predicted, you know, what, what was gonna happen back then? Um, so I think that that's the opportunity. So if the question is, okay, is there enough revenue opportunity today to get involved? I would say, yes, it's smaller now, but the opportunity is out here. And so if you want to build Microsoft, you have to start today. And you probably had to start four years ago. Thanks, Christopher. That was a great answer. Um, Dennis, are you seeing similar growth or how do you see quantum um, cybersecurity, this quantum cybersecurity market changing over the next couple of years? Yeah, it's already just changed in the last couple of years because we're a little bit decoupled from the quantum computing industry because this transformation is driven by standards. It's compliance. NIST issues a new standard. Your company's in you know, finance. You have to transition. It's, it's not optional for you. It's also in a different space because cybersecurity is a durable market. It gets bigger and bigger every year with more devices, more connectivity, Internet of Things, more data going back and forth. Um, so we're, we're a little bit immune to whatever happens with quantum computers. We're happy to see them scale quicker because that means people will transition faster. It's now that people are finally realizing as there's more wired magazine articles and things like that, uh, raising awareness of the threat from quantum computers and how long it's really going to take to transition and how much effort that's going to be within a company. And you have to build a team to do that. You have to build a team to learn how to use quantum computers. You need one to develop quantum secure solutions and take all your legacy software, transition those, transform all of your web interfaces, your portals, your hardware appliances, your industrial infrastructure that runs on a completely different system. As you bring all those systems online and collect, connect them to the internet, you open more security holes. That opens a lot of space for companies to develop solutions just for that one piece, for the electrical grid, for water infrastructure. We saw the uh, Colonial Pipeline attack as another example where there needs to be solutions just for that market that will come out of this development process from post-quantum algorithms that are coming online now. And the more people with the more money that realize they have a lot more to lose, and this has been going on for a long time, the more people are on board with doing this quickly. And as we get that level of awareness going up from literally what the folks like Zapata and the quantum computing industry is doing is raising the level of awareness on their side, what they could do with quantum computers. They're game changing. We've never had a transition in technology like this before. You know, all the supercomputers in the world combined relative to an abacus is about the same to a, a sizable quantum computer. So you can solve problems with a quantum computer that can never be solved with all the supercomputers you could ever build with every atom in the universe. So this is a really big transformation. And in cybersecurity, it's a really big known threat that people have been preparing for for a long time. Harvesting data literally goes back a half a century. It's never been cheaper to store that now and to harvest it today easier and to exploit it in the future better because I don't have to own a quantum computer one day. I'll just use software in the cloud and IBM's cloud quantum computers rent five bucks a month, wherever it's going to cost in the future and break all the stuff that I've been storing for a decade. 
you probably didn't change your bank account or your social security number or your healthcare provider ID in the last 20 years. Um, all that stuff's been harvested already and it can be exploited in the future. We're gonna have to transition a lot of these things away very quickly and that won't happen with the flip of a switch. And more and more CEOs are realizing that now and there is board level accountability of cybersecurity breaches. That could be an existential threat to many companies today. Uh, paying ransomware you know, to Russian hackers, those days have to come to an end. And if you know, the front office and the board have not held management accountable for this, it's not just a waste of money anymore, something that I have to do begrudgingly. It's gonna be a part of every one of those discussions in the future. And again, this quantum version is you know, great for my industry. It's not good for the people that suffer those breaches in the future and have that persistent risk that they can't get rid of very quickly. It will take a long time. Sorry, I'm still having problems with Zoom. Um, Reed, speaking of problems with Zoom, do you agree with uh, what Christopher and Dennis are saying about revenue and quantum computing? Where do you see early revenue coming? And uh, maybe talk a little bit about where you see the most growth. Sure. Um, also, I will agree as a seed stage investor, it's, it's really hard for us to to predict or count on uh, reliable revenue forecasts um, with the companies that we work with. So I, I do agree that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of awareness that enterprises have to be ready and there's a lot of prep. So there is, there is real revenue in education and locking up IP um, that could be valuable once the, the, the compute resources are available. Um, that's hard for uh, a VC investor to invest in, but to give some examples, we um, uh, there's a category of investments that, that I personally think of that we've made, which are new processes, where the end result might actually be a commodity. It, it's a new way to use electricity to make clean steel it's, instead of using fossil furnaces. It's, it's a new process, electrochemical process to create lime for cement. Uh, using renewable resources, again, instead of a, a, a giant kiln um, uh, that's heating up limestone. And those uh, new processes require many new materials, uh, new ways to create high heat for creating green hydrogen from electrolyzers at 700 degrees C. Uh, you can't do it with membrane you know, electrolyzers. So, so who's going to have the ability to invent the materials that will support the industrialization of these processes. You know, we're looking at some, there was a pitch this last week from a company that has, um, it, it, they wanna do, it's, think of it as direct air capture. So remove carbon from the atmosphere, but um, there's a lot of policy issues around this approach, but their idea is we will design a system that fits in a 20 foot cargo container that takes seawater and deacidifies it and then dumps it back uh, because um, alkyl, you know, if it's deacidified, it will, it will, it will absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we're like, oh, how, you know, how many cargo containers do you need to, to process, remove a megaton of carbon a year? Um, 6,000. So, you know, be, efficiently being able to design and engineer these kinds of very large scale things um, requires a whole bunch of new materials new new uh, um, that can't efficiently be designed with before you get to the quantum computing era so I do I do agree with with both Dennis and, and Christopher that number one you have to prepare and that there will be second order effects that maybe to be value captured by other businesses on top of the, the compute and software and hardware platforms and and number two Dennis I do agree with you that Wow, we, we're really digging a hole deeper, whether it's cybersecurity or climate. Um, we're going to need some pretty big tools to get out of the hole that we're digging today. And, and that's, that's a lot of the value of, of the quantum. That's partly why the engine, when we invest, it's not like we have a checkerboard of, of a thesis across the UN 17 sustainable development goals that we're trying to invest in, in, in every 
box, um, but we do look for things that um, where investments we make really can accelerate the success of other companies in the portfolio. So, hey, if if Zapata is successful, if, if a hard, quantum hardware um, company investment is successful, the materials design work um, that is gonna be necessary for some of these process-based investments we've already made around you know, cement, steel, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, um, that all of it will accelerate. And, and that, that is, is very much part of our, our long-term thinking is we look for through lines that connect. For instance, in climate, we invest in generation, uh, fusion, deep geothermal storage, um, large-scale uh, iron air batteries connected to the grid, transmission, superconducting, uh, power lines that can pack a lot of power through existing narrow corridors. If you want to get hydropower from Canada to New York, New York and Maine doesn't want to widen the, the, the corridors. How do you transmit? And then resource efficiency. Um, how do you use less energy, less fossil to, to create these commodity materials? So all of these sort of supporting investments, quantum hardware software it, to me is, is, is a really uh, solid foundation that, that it will move many of our portfolio companies forward faster as it, as it becomes real. And Reed, just to ask you another question, um, is there a lot of opportunity for early stage investing? You talked about today that you're, you funded a company, an unnamed company, um, but is there a lot of companies starting up and still getting funded in the quantum computing market? I, I believe there are. Um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're quite, the engine is quite Boston centric um, out of the 40 investments we've made. Only four of them are outside of Boston. Um, and even with that, we've, we've looked at eight or 10 full stack quantum compute projects, a bunch of component level uh, work. Um, uh, and then not to mention other quantum sensing and, and, and communication uh, projects that we've also taken a close look at. Um, so there's, there's a lot of research activity and then there's a lot of um, early in career. There's something sci-fi and fun about it that, that attracts talent. And, and so I, th I think it, it, it is a, a, a pretty rich, continues to be a pretty rich area despite all the competition from the, the, the bigger companies and the more mature companies. Yeah, there is. There are a lot of companies now, bigger companies especially. Now, one of the things that happened when since we talked last year is that a couple of companies have gone public uh, through SPACs. So two hardware companies have gone public. Um, Christopher, do you see this as a good move for the industry? Um, what's your opinion on on the SPAC? I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, SPACs are, and it's becoming more so, uh, maybe you're familiar with uh, just uh, last week or so, um, the SEC has come out with new guidelines to say that we shouldn't be using, you know, projections so willy-nilly uh, in such a willy-nilly manner with anything. I mean, so SPACs are a specific subset of how do you go public? It, it, is going public a good thing? It depends, right? It depends on the company, the opportunity. Um, uh, and uh, the maturity of uh, a company's ability to handle being a public company. So it's not for everyone. Um, it's not for everyone, even from an exit perspective, because for the people operating it, it's not an exit. Uh, let me assure you, I haven't gone through that uh, before uh, into taking a company public um, uh, previously. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It's also expensive. Uh, you know, you have to bring your company up to, you know, uh, accounting standards and management standards and, and, and whatnot that, that, that have a, a, a much higher um, bar as far as scrutiny goes to be able to do this. Um, if you're able to do that, are there advantages to being a public company? Absolutely. Um, and in deep tech, particularly, perhaps. I mean, we've seen this in biotech. So if you think that, you know, the, the opportunity is more of a step function, you're going to need a lot of cash to get there. And so, for example, if you're a hardware, quantum hardware maker, and you think that, you know, the, the real step function is five or six years out, uh, and the near-term revenue opportunities are limited to bring you to a good EBITDA number that you would trade on, well, then uh, being public and having a huge uh, war chest that will more certainly get you there, um, probability-wise, is probably a good idea. 
um, it's really hard to keep diluting, diluting, diluting with private capital and say, you know, this is a bridge to nowhere, uh, you know, 10 years out, particularly like not every fund is like, you know, the engine that, that has 18 years to wait uh, in deep tech. You know, the typical fund is seven years. You know, you got to write a check to your LPs. You know, the, that's who they, the VCs work for, right? The, you know, there's accountability there. And, and for a reason, you know, this isn't, you know, forever. And it's not a loan. Uh, you got to pay it back in equity uh, money that, that gets liquid. So from that perspective, uh, you, you know, the timeframes that we're looking at here, uh, I think it's very difficult to think that, you know, with hardware, um, that you're going to endlessly fund, um, you know, deep, deep capex in, in in a company. And so, for a company like INQ or Rigetti to go out and have several million dollars as a war chest to compete for the talent to, uh, you know, uh, be able to build this uh, these systems and really have enough cash left over when that um, uh, point happens is very similar to like biotech, and that's been a model that you know investors are um, familiar with. This step function thing, and you know, if it works, I've got several billion dollars of uh, 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 worth of a, a product at the end of the uh, end of the day. Um, you know, if you can cure cancer, will someone pay for the cancer drug? Well, if you pass phase three, it means that it's better than everything out there by de by definition. So, you know, if you're able to get there, great. What are the percentages of that? And you know, people have learned how to figure that out as a public entity. So. Uh, all that is to say that, no, it's not a terrible idea if investors will accept that thesis that we're waiting for five or six years until we get the real return, but we're investing now because we see that trajectory um, for those hardware companies. Um, for software companies like us, I think it's a little bit easier, um, uh, you know, as an equation, because I don't think it's, we have, we don't have to wait that long, as I've said, you know, you know, in our particular case, we've got you know, uh, multi-million dollar, multi-year contracts with, with large companies already there, that are coming in. So, um, uh, in preparation and also in, you know, quasi, uh, quantum, if you will, implementation. So, um, even for a company like us, maybe going public would be a, a good idea. Now, is that the route that most people will end up with as an exit? Um, probably not. And not a lot of companies, the public market probably can't support 30 or 40 of these things. Um, there are probably a few, and there probably will be a few more. Um, so going public, yes. Um, SPAC, maybe. Um, I think the interesting thing here for SPACs, people should realize, is that SPACs were kind of developed as a mechanism to kind of usurp what would be a C round in a typical event in technology, right? You do your A round, your C round, your A round, your B round, and C round is really growth. So you've got typically you know, a few tens of millions of dollars or at least a, a double digit 10, 10 or up million dollars of ARR, the um, annual recurring revenue already in the company, and you're at a growth phase. Typically at that point, you don't go to someone like Reed or the engine to, to get um, venture capital money per se, you get growth money. That's really later stage money, right? And that's C round. The problem with C round has been that only these insider large ish kind of funds, you know, Providence Equity, Goldman Sachs Growth, or these kind of people, you know, the rich getting richer are the only people who could access that. And if you're a public person with your money and fidelity with your 401k plan, you don't get that growth piece. And, you know, this, this C round is kind of the sweet spot for investing, you would think, because all the risk of will it even happen is kind of gone because you got revenues, you got market fit and it's growing. Okay. But it's not yet public and there's yet not yet liquidity. Uh, so, you know, there's a big gap between 10 million and 100 million. The multiples you pay, you get for growing from 10 million to 100 million is huge, the difference. So the investment opportunity is great. So the SPAC, what it's done essentially is take that C round product as a financial instrument and allow the public to invest, invest in that, to democratize that piece. So the whole idea behind SPACs is, look, we're going to do... Um, we're going to raise the money, pre-raise the money to go acquire a company that would normally be a growth company and then bring the money to the table so they don't have to go through this long uh, underwritten IPO process and kind of accelerate it. So is that a bad thing? No, uh, if it's done right. The problem has been in the last couple of years, there's been like everything else, a boom, wow, that's a great idea. Let's all put our money in that. And so you've got this frothy thing where a lot of SPACs have gotten done. 
there isn't the scrutiny, there wasn't the scrutiny until recently with the SEC's new rules that they've announced on the numbers and what you're doing, whatever. And we've seen things like, you know, a couple of people and a business plan that says, I'm going to create a flying taxi company, literally. Uh, and this would normally be kind of an A round company because they haven't proven market fit. They're not growth, they're nothing. They haven't even shown they can build it. They don't even have a, a, a proof of concept that they can show you. It's literally a, a PowerPoint presentation and they're worth a billion dollars. So is that a good thing? Probably not, right? So, you know, caveat emptor. Um, is INQ a real company with a real machine that works? Yes, we've actually used the machine. It exists. It really works. Those are really, uh, this is not Theranos. It's not, you know, uh, it, it, there's an actual machine and we've done generative modeling neural network stuff on it and produced results that are better than a classical computer. It's actually really real. Uh, I, I, I can promise you that. Um, uh, so, you know, and will it, will that be the one that wins that scales? No, but that's the same with biotech, right? Like, uh, it, it, is it going to be this biotech company or the other biotech company that eventually gets the, the drug? Maybe both of them. It's not a zero-sum game either. So are SPACs necessarily a, a negative thing? No, uh, but buyer beware, right? And the good news, I think, for the industry is that the SEC has stepped in in the last couple of weeks and said, you got to be like a, a basically an IPO company. Like if you're going to give, you have to give projections, but you better have a fairness opinion on those, right? Uh, you have to, uh, you know, uh, if you're going to give projections, they have to be disclosed and they have to be caveated and all of this kind of stuff. And they have to be looked at by a third party. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you have to pick a good uh, valuation range that's justifiable or you're going to get sued. Um, and, you know, the CEO and the CFO should be liable. These are what are suggested as, you know, the, the kind of, uh, uh, rules, new rules, which is very much like a real IPO company. When I went through it the first time in an IPO, it's like you sign with blood on the dotted line, your auditing statement and, and everything that you said and blah, 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 you know, forever hold my peace um, as, as the CEO. Uh, and, and that's maybe a good thing. So now we're seeing this start to consolidate. Um, and I think that, you know, companies out there that are legitimate, like an INQ or a Getty, if they take advantage of this and they're able to get enough capital and they're able to trade well, I think, you know, what was INQ today? 11s, which is above, you know, 10% up, even in the horrible tech environment and the collapsing of everything and people saying recession, whatever, it's trading up from where it was at its IPO. And not a lot of companies have been. So for quantum specifically, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good mechanism. And going public is not a bad mechanism. I think it's an opportunity for the public to invest in something that I think we all agree in this conversation is going to be revolutionary. Thank you, Christopher. Um, also in the past year, we've had a quantum cybersecurity company SPAC. And so Dennis, I don't know if you wanna comment about where you see quantum cybersecurity companies going over the next year if you see more SPACs or more IPOs, or what is your vision on what you think is going to happen? Yeah, there's so many people jumping into cybersecurity, and I feel like, uh, especially with crypto, there's fewer qualified people to do it. It's a very kind of esoteric field. That's why there's so few companies in our space. And SPACs, you know, to Chris's point, they're a great way for some technologies that could otherwise never be funded to get funded. In quantum, everything is expensive, especially if you touch hardware. It's gonna take much longer than you think. Um, the Theranos problem is looming though, because if you've gone through a SPAC and you know we get asked about this a lot uh, and you haven't proven anything publicly, you haven't published, you haven't demonstrated revenue that's now, that's not, you know, round day kind of thing, um, then, you know, everyone should be asking those questions. And it's going to be really bad for everyone that something like that happens in the quantum industry when it's so few companies, you know, we're in the QEDC, there's 150 companies in there. You know, how many of those are three people? You know, we're a small company, we're 50 people. Those are the ones that really need to grow and survive. And one company gets a billion dollar valuation with nothing that anyone can kick the tires on. No one can ask questions. They don't show up to events like this. And uh, 
tell everyone what they're doing, where their revenue is coming from, how their algorithms and software work. We can't go to their website, try something on their portal. That makes everyone concerned. And it's a continuous topic of discussion that, uh, you know, at the DC, but a lot of the same conferences as me, that, that we get asked about it a lot. And as I said, it's great when it works and it's all a way to get new technology that otherwise would be impossible to get funded to the market and let smaller participants invest in it. But in those very few cases where it's potentially toxic, a lot of people are gonna lose their money. It's gonna be bad for the industry and it'll ultimately maybe bring on a quantum winner that people occasionally talk about with the recession. So I just, I'm in Austin and I spent some time with uh, Dr. Scott Aronson and he was very, um, he's, he's, he has always has this great dead on opinion. And he said, unless there's a, unless there's a scientific publication along with the press release, um, he, he feels that you, you need to have a little bit of a perspective when looking at what people announce. So he's very much for look at the science and use the science as a way to gauge the company versus uh, press or press releases. So I thought that's I'll a add, very good, go I'll, on. I'll echo that is that if you've published your research in a peer review journal, like in cryptography, it's the IACR.org, for example, everyone's good with that. If it's published in Axios or something, not to denigrate them, that's not publishing. That's appealing to people who don't really understand what you're saying. You could potentially get away with a lot there that you would never get away with in a professional peer reviewed journal article. Well, great. I think we've had about an hour's worth of discussion. Um, I don't know, Reed, if you wanna say something, a uh, final comment before we go to the questions. Um, you're on mute, of course, like us. There you um, go. I, I, lo I love the field of quantum computing and it's it's a um, it's a perfect fit for what the engine was asked to do when MIT put us into business. Um, so I, I'm a, a, a strong supporter and true believer. Um, so that's I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, Eddie and Larry, I think I'm going to go to the questions. If that's okay with you. That's, that's great. We got a lot of questions in the list here. Okay, sure. So the first question is for Christopher. Uh, what are your thoughts on full stack capabilities, including infrastructure offering quantum application builds? Um, companies like AWS and Google, including the new Google spinoff Sandbox, they are inviting people to partake in. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah um... Well, infrastructure, is it gonna be part of the equation? Yes. Um, full stack, you know, what's in a definition, right? What do we mean by that? You know, uh, I hear that term thrown around a lot. And a lot of time it's thrown around by people who are building a quantum computer and they've, you know, their pitch to investors is, it's full stack, meaning that we've got everything, including the software you need to access it, um, up to including that. Um, full stack enterprise solution means something just different for someone like me who's worked for a Fortune 38 company doing enterprise architecture, right? If I want to develop a solution that's going to go to production, it's not just my GPU stack and CUDA. That's not a solution, okay? That's not a game, <laughs> uh, you know, a full game solution for network gaming. It's not NVIDIA and CUDA, right? But NVIDIA and CUDA is the building block that you need. And you could say that that's a full stack GPU software and hardware solution, right? The, the truth is, but what are people buying? Uh, they're buying a network gaming solution or they're the people, the software company that's using uh, GPU stack with CUDA on Amazon to do something, right? Um, so I, I think we have to be really careful about saying, okay, we're full stack and assume that that means uh, that you're going, here, here, here's where it goes. Okay, we have a full stack. Therefore, we have everything you need to create all the solution. And therefore, you don't need any other software companies or any consultants or anything else. We have you, we own the world, ha, 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 ha. 
uh, we will own the entire world and we're going to create a wall garden so that everyone has to come to our quantum machine. They can't go to any other quantum machine. It's a zero sum game and we won. And we get all the revenue worldwide for every quantum computing application that's ever going to be written uh, uh, under heaven. That's kind of the, 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 the thing that I've heard people kind of trying to imply uh, by saying full stack. And uh, some people are buying into that. I, I think that that's dangerous because the truth is uh, when you say full stack quantum, you're saying, okay, uh, we're building. And I think this is what's reasonably meant by that is, okay, here's infrastructure up to the compiling step of here's a circuit that I'm gonna run, kind of like CUDA is, okay? Turning that into a solution and application is an entire uh, other thing, right? Now you've got to take uh, data, some data, hopefully it's computing something, right? So whether that's over chemical libraries or you know some, something that's machine learning, so a bunch of voice files that you have uh, stored up uh, to do natural language understanding or whatever it's going to be, right? Uh, you got to process that data, clean that data, serve up that data, and then decide based on that data what my hyperparameter search space is going to be. All that's happening on a classical computer. And nobody's really building that whole thing as a full stack. Okay, so uh, really, uh, is infrastructure going to exist up to, say, the, the equivalent of an API for a cloud CUDA? Yes, maybe. Um, another thing to be careful, though, of is, are you really going to purchase that through a, a cloud provider or not? Uh, maybe, but the problem is you got to get your data there to compute it there. And we've seen already that IBM has put an actual quantum computer at the, at, 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 um, at Cleveland Clinic. And they put another one in Germany and they put another one in Japan. Why didn't they just do it all over the cloud in New York? Because there's this thing called latency and TCP IP is not a performant way to do high performance computing over multiple clouds. Uh, multiple data sources that are in different places. It's not efficient, right? Uh, you, if you're gonna do that, you gotta stream it somehow and that's gonna be really quick. So the truth is the real data center of this is going to be something like what, what's been proposed in Germany, where you have a quantum computer and an, a high performance computer together, at least in the same data center, at least on the same fiber switch, right? That's got to happen because you're not going to get the data there and compute it quick enough, uh, you know, over three seconds around trip and around the world on TCP IP. That's not ever going to work. So it's okay to do uh, experiments that way, but that's not the real stack. The real stack is high performance computing living right next to. And actually, if you look at a, you know, there's a company called Seek in, uh, that is spun out of I, uh, an IBM spin out. So there's spin out of a spin out that, that does stuff for the military that I think that, uh, you know, Dennis in another life would be familiar with, where they're doing, you know, cryo based um, uh, high, 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 high speed stuff for things we can't talk about, right? Um, you know, that they go really, really, really fast, faster than sound, for example, and you got to compute things to where you're going to aim that thing, right? Um, uh, so that kind of thing happening in a cryo situation uh, is something that people are working on because ideally you actually not only want it on the same fiber switch, you want them in the same refrigerator, at least at 4K in the superconducting context. So this is all to say, they ain't going to be cloud necessarily, right? And the people who naively say, yeah, cloud computing quantum, it's like a contradiction. It's an oxymoron to people actually doing this stuff, right? It's going to be in a data center. Amazon may own one and try to serve that up as a service, but the truth is they don't do that in HPC today. Uh, NVIDIA still sells a lot of cards to the military, believe it or not. And they don't use the cloud, even though they've got a secure cloud to do that. Um, you know, companies like, you know, our, our friends, one of our investors uh, very publicly has their own supercomputing thing um, called Curiosity, BSF, right? They do it on-prem for a reason. They've got sensitive data that they cannot even geographically, even if they wanted to move out of Germany, they're not allowed to, right? Um, and they won't. Uh, and that's actually in the high performance computing market, government regulated, pharma regulated, finance and banks regulated. All the markets that we talk about they're all regulated industries. It ain't going to be very easily all on the cloud. And most likely, just as in with GPUs, they're going to be doing some of that stuff on-prem. So the idea that, okay, Amazon's going to own the world or IBM or any one cloud is going to own the world, probably not going to happen. 
unless it's Google themselves doing something or IBM themselves doing something. Um, because the other dirty secret out there is that everyone, including the military and every other big company in the Fortune 100 is on multiple clouds except for those companies, pretty much, or maybe Salesforce, right? Um, but uh, you know, if you're if you're any kind of industry that involves real stuff around the world, and your RR around the world is your market, you're in a multi-cloud, multi-data center environment, and you have on-prem stuff. So it's probably not going to be so easy for Amazon to own the entire world. They'll have a piece of it, but just as in high-performance computing today, not everyone's on Elastic HPC at Amazon. That's my answer. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, we have a question from Larry. Um, Dennis, I'm hoping you can describe what you think some of the major tech and engineering milestones uh, of the last 12 months were in uh, cybersecurity and where you think it's going. I've talked about it a little, this is a little bit of a repeat, but maybe a little bit more talking about what's happened in the past 12 months or so. Yeah, some, some of the biggest things that have started to happen are um, the return to an internet and infrastructure that's private, which, you know, the internet that's evolved today, as we know from all of this, like almost continuous flow of reaches that we hear about from, you know, the OPM records from our classified backgrounds to, you know, our whatever social media accounts. Uh, that accountability is now coming online and people realize that we built the internet itself and global communications infrastructure the wrong way. And one of the biggest pieces of that is combining the cryptographic pieces, the keys that encrypt our data with the data itself. That's how it goes around the world. People don't realize that. And so decoupling those two things uh, make it impossible for all these big companies who guarantee end-to-end -end encryption, but not from them, to make that really come true. Uh, just most recently, they're not the only ones, I don't wanna single them out, but um, if you saw what happened with WhatsApp, that they're actually data mining on client side, the information that you're inputting into the app. So, well, yes, it's true that it's end-to-end -end encrypted between you and your counterparty. That's not really end-to-end uh, -end encrypted when we're talking about it cryptographically. It means that only Alice and Bob are the only two people in the world that could open that message and read it. So that, that's been the biggest change that that's coming around. And that's really part of this whole PQC uh, post quantum discussion is that we did a lot of things wrong to get it done very quickly. We built it for data mining. We built it to make it really easy and fast. We didn't really build it that securely. And in fact, a lot of the big companies, I think I mentioned this call in a previous one, are seeing these big problems on the crypto side. And Samsung was the most recent one where 100 million of their cell phones were found to be vulnerable, the security behind them. And so they're realizing, hey, this is a very, uh, a, a space where there's not a lot of room for error. Very small errors have very large consequences to millions or hundreds of millions or even billions of devices. So this has to be decoupled at some layer um, to companies like us that do only crypto. We don't care about data. We're not in data mining business. We only make your system secure from point A to point B. And a lot of companies are coming out of the woodwork now that have been stealth for a few years with similar solutions. And it's good for everyone. This is you know, big business for national economic security. We, we don't wanna see IP disappearing that companies have spent millions or even billions of dollars researching a new pharmaceutical and suddenly a generics made you know, in country X overseas and puts a small US startup that spent 10 years developing something out of business because they didn't pay for the R&D. So that, that big change is, is what I've seen in the last 12 months and this transition to post-quantum has really driven it. And really, whenever there's an announcement, you know, hopefully we'll see one from Adam soon about quantum supremacy or the next big scale quantum computer come out and be available online. I know Chris, you don't like it, but, but we like it because it's it really, it's a call to action for a lot of companies to do something better to strengthen their security, which is ultimately good for all of us. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, one of the questions I'm going to ask Reed is whether you feel that it's time that there's going to be a lot of um, need for independent quantum computing consultants 
and uh, there are questions about how you would move into that space. Um, are, are you seeing a lot of opportunity around consulting? I think there will be kind of a talent shortage um, as, as the demand grows and as the capabilities grow. So um, the, the, the question though is kind of what type of background would make you a great you know, algorithm designer? Um, I'm not, you know, Christopher, you can also chime in on this one. I'm not sure that computer science it is transfers over as easily as chemistry or physics uh, or, or pure math. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know in, within Zapata, what's a common tr technical training background for some of your, your, your great um, algorithm developers? Yeah, I, I'd say we've we've seen transition, and even people we've brought in interns and whatever. Um, the way that you do the computation is fundamentally different. So, if mm -hmm. you really don't understand quantum mechanics and you just did, you know, uh, you know, standard uh, classical computing for you know four years of undergrad and even a PhD, in some ways you're almost at a deficit because you haven't learned mm -hmm. this new mathematical way of doing it. Not to say that someone who's a PhD in computer science can't understand what the algorithm is or what an algorithm is or how you have to take a mathematical problem you know, in equation land and turn that into uh, bits and bytes uh, oh. and compute it. But yeah, I think you do need to get the quantum mechanics uh, and understand how you're computing this. That is fundamental. You know, you, How do I turn a partial differential equation into a Hamiltonian problem? You know, mm -hmm. and, and this, 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 you know, wave function energy thing. Uh, well, you got to understand what a wave function is and what energy thing is. And most computer science undergrads don't get that, uh, but unless they've had physics. So can you learn it? Yes. We've had people who don't have a physics background who are kind of computer people and they've gone and they've taught themselves that because they're good at math. So they can learn mm -hmm. quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is linear algebra. Right. So at the end of the day, it's integers, you know, it's not continuous function. So it's in some ways easier, um, but you, you, you got to understand that and convert. I, but we found it's much easier to take someone who's a really strong physicist or physical chemist mm -hmm. and turn them into being a uh, and teach them enough computer science and teach them how to code and teach them, you know, the algorithm part of the, the development, that kind of the math, than it is to take a computer science person and turn them into a quantum programmer. Now, having said that, you know, can you, is there a lot of stuff in and around the quantum industry to do that that's not related to quantum computing? Yes, there's a lot of just straight Python you have to do, so you can still get a job. Mm -hmm. And do the people that you had in, in within Zapata who re-educated themselves, do they do it with, um, you know, Coursera or MIT edX or, or kind of, where do they start? Is it just, you know, book cramming through textbooks? And yeah, a lot of it is, you know, it's self-learning, but it's from a lot of texts that are out there on, on how to do this. There, there, there are some good ones uh, out there. I think some have uh, kind of uh, bootstrapped themselves with the MIT course. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the same one that Eddie may have taken, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Will Oliver's course there to kind of get going. Uh, but mm -hmm. to get deep, uh, a lot of it's been kind of hands-on too. It's like getting on the IBM Q experience thing and running through the algorithm, seeing how it's written. And, and, and that part, the mechanical part of like coding Python libraries isn't the harder part with the conversion. It's the thinking of what is quantum mechanics and how is this computation happening? So what is Shor's algorithm actually, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are the steps to it? How does it actually attack the problem? How, how do you convert? A problem into something that Shor's like for fault tolerant stuff. How do you create a NISC algorithm? What is this? What is an Ising model? Um, mm -hmm. That kind of stuff um, you can self teach, um, and there there are some online mentoring courses out there. Uh, one of our engineers, uh, Michal uh, Steckley, uh, he um, has a, a bunch of YouTube's out there and, and on on this uh, and and. Uh, there's an actual mentoring program that'll mm. you know bring people into that field. So there are resources out there. I will say it's kind of mishmash. There isn't a quantum computing department in universities yet, really. Harvard's now recently developed a PhD program, uh, but mostly it's like kind of the early days of computer science when I'm old enough to remember when it was applied math, mm -hmm. and you get a computer science degree from the math department. Because uh, there was no one else doing it, or you get somebody who's doing calculations for in mechanical engineering, but they happen to be doing computer science, and that's how you learn about it. Um, there wasn't a formal degree, 
we're now at the uh, stage where some uh, master's degree, University of Wisconsin and the University of Rhode Island have applied master's degrees now in uh, quantum computing. Uh, and so you can now finally get a master's degree um, in formal education. Uh, but outside of those very few and far between programs, a lot of this is going to have to be you know, self-taught. And that's how people are doing it. Um, mm -hmm. They've been, you know, like Yudong, our CTO, he was a mechanical engineer at Peru, uh, Purdue. And then uh, he stepped into a computer science department that was working just by chance on quantum computing. And he happened to be in that lab and he happened to be able to create that stuff and self-teach himself because there was no one to teach him. A lot of our other employees were in Alon's lab. And as you know, Alon was in the theoretical chemistry department at Harvard. And that's where a lot of people went uh, to learn how to write algorithms for not just chemistry, but uh, other things. Um, so uh, it's very, very much hit and miss, but there are there are some resources out there to convert yourself if you want to do it. And reach out to us if you're, you know, you're really interested in say you're a physicist and you want to do this or a computer scientist and you want to do this. We can kind of lead you to people who are doing those mentoring programs. Denise, I, and, and others can, can kind of give you some pointers. Yeah, why don't I, Eddie and Larry, why don't I hand it back to you now? Uh, I, I got a question here that, that we, we all have, that really haven't touched into, but is, I think it's an important aspect of what, what we're talking about is the emergence of the quantum internet. I know that uh, the, 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 the Department of Energy has recently published a blueprint of, the, of this kind of uh, layout, the step-by-step -step strategy is how to make the quantum internet real. Is this something that's going to be really allocated just for defense, and, and 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 or is it going to be open to the world? Is it going to be available to to the to to the to the, to the marketplace? I mean, uh, will this have implications in, in terms of uh, what Christopher was talking about? How limitations of of, of, of current uh, networks and 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 uh, and different. Uh, quantum la la labs and networks, and I, I just just want your take into who where, where we stand with with, with the quantum internet. Is it, is it going to happen? Is it, is it is it a real thing? I'm involved in one of those projects, and you know a lot of people have their own definition of what a quantum internet is. And from an academic perspective, and you know Christopher, anyone uh, Denise chime in. To me, it's just the uh, used to transmit qubits and connect quantum computers, that's it. But other people talk about it as something else, which is largely for marketing purposes. And I get asked a lot about it because they think it's a secure version of the internet that securely transmits bits. And that's not really what I see happening with it for the foreseeable future. It's really just makes quantum computers connected and making bigger quantum computers over the internet. and you know, within a data center and transmitting qubits is hard over any type of fiber. There's QKD networks that people talk about as being the quantum internet, right. quantum key distribution. Here in the US, the NSA is very much against that because of, you know, several issues with it, like authentication. But in Europe and in Asia and Russia, they're building a massive one uh, to do only one thing. It's not to transmit any information at all. It's only to move cryptographic keys around from data centers. Huh. And, and right now, at the rates that the internet moves data around, it's just not practical even to move around AES keys other than from a trusted node network. So it means a lot of things publicly now, but in reality, again, anyone else chime in? To me, it's just- Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's marketing. I mean, even the QKD thing, it's, I think, you know, geostate. Uh, marketing in some way. Well, you know, we made it to the moon, Sputnik or whatever. I don't know. Um, is kind of the way I'm looking at it because uh, these these systems, even now, uh, these massive systems they're building. Uh, you know, you can't clone quantum information, so uh, you need repeaters. But they're not really repeaters in the classical sense. They're decryptors and re-encryptors. Re uh, so basically, every few kilometers or so, you need to have a vulnerability point on your network. And we don't have that with TCP IP. So I can't not see that being a practical or even necessary solution when we have other things uh, that can help us that are post-quantum 
uh, even in the networking space to encrypt things that you know companies like Dennis's are are are, are working on uh, that that are better, more robust, and they work on classical things that are dependent. There's really no need to put quantum information in a quantum superimposed uh, superpositioned state over a network, right? Why would you do that? You're why. You know, the only situation in which that becomes necessary, and Dennis already referred to that, is when you're using parallelization, you want parallelization of quantum algorithms onto multiple quantum machines. So in other words, you want to maintain the quantum state of this thing in whatever weight between zero and one it is, right? And I'm going to send that, you know, to this computer to do uh, more computation. I'm going to send this one over here to do that same computation so I can parallelize different things, right, in an algorithm. So when you're doing what we would call is distributed computing in the same data center between quantum computers, so I'm moving from one to another, um, uh, that may be useful. So that local area networking, LAN, quantum LAN makes sense. Quantum WAN, I think, doesn't even make any sense. For, I, don't, I can't come up with, maybe someone else can, for a reason why I would do that. You know, it's kind of like, why would I use a quantum computer to do, you know, floating point stuff? It's just a very expensive way to freeze your computer down to, to absolute zero. Um, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you know, it's a, maybe yeah. a great marketing trick and you can call it quantum and have some quantum fairy dust on your stock price for that. But, uh, but it, it doesn't make any kind of sense to me scientifically whatsoever. It, it has worked, and there, as you know, there's a multi-billion dollar TKD company now in China. Yep. So, great marketing. Uh, quantum internet marketing works. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> are, are there any more questions? Larry, Larry do you want to yeah, yeah, have a question? So if anyone in the audience has any final questions, we're gonna wrap up in the next 10 minutes or less. Uh, please get them into the chat now. And uh, I have a question, I just put it into the chat, but uh, you know, like the race to the moon, uh, there's a race in quantum. And where is the US and the West uh, compared to China and Russia? And what are the security and you know, uh, business implications? Good question. Yeah. I mean, China has now done what Google has done. They've caught up really quickly to the 50 some qubit level and they're able to do um, the same level of entanglement and fidelity. Um, you know, uh, have they created useful software systems? Not yet, nobody has. Um, but a lot of the basic science that, um, that Google even used to, to John Martinez's group benefited from uh, came out of China anyway. You know, go to the archive and look at how many you know, basic science uh, stuff in both the encryption world, crypto world, and in quantum computing, in this whole area uh, of endeavor, there's a, there are a lot of, you know, there's a billion very well-trained, uh, mathematically oriented people over there, a billion plus, uh, right? Uh, and by just by population density, arithmetic, and uh, probability, you're going to get a lot of the best quantum people coming out of China, right? And uh, they are uh, definitely catching up. Uh, we have 300 million people in the United States. There are 1. Point whatever billion uh, people in China, uh, more, you know, um, at least five times as many and probably more because there are more people studying math and science in China than there are in the US and at a higher level, I would say, because we don't force our kids to take calculus in middle school, um, which we probably should do um, if we wanna be competitive. Um, so the truth is other countries uh, have what I've said, you know, math, math and physics is the answer here, right? Can't teach that to someone who's got a degree in history very easily, right? Um, so they have more people and a more uh, higher concentration of people who can do that in China. So even when you look at this at a 20 year competition, this is a long game in my view, uh, there's a huge advantage in places like China and India that have a huge number of students at the middle school level who can do linear algebra. That's it. You can do linear algebra, you can do quantum. There are more people who know how to do linear algebra in China and India than there are in the United States by a huge margin. And the ones who are here are mostly foreign at the PhD level, honestly. I'll add to that that China has outspent this 20X in government investment in their quantum industry. They've also centralized it 
in a couple of locations, whereas we're balkanized here in the US. You know, Crypt, we, we work with several national labs around the country, uh, academics, other companies to build the things that we need to do at hardware. They've got all that in one place, all the, you know, oscilloscopes, all the cryostat, everything else you need to make it all in one place. And there's a thousand companies that are trying to do it, get access to all that same infrastructure and money that's difficult to get here in the US. And we have the National Quantum Initiative, but that's only a little over a billion dollars. We've got a bunch of smaller programs through NSF and other people. That's just not enough. And you know, we've talked about it this whole talk. The, the, the quantum race, that's something we have to win. That's such a market advantage for the country that develops that first and has the software behind it to make it practical for things like pharmaceuticals or better batteries or, or you name the problem, that it may be an insurmountable barrier. If another country like China, well-financed, well-developed, well-motivated and entrepreneurial gets in front of us on this, they will take over the world economy very quickly because there are problems that cannot be done without a quantum computer. There are entire industries that will be spawned from having big quantum computers. We really need to win this one. And they're willing to play games on a different playing field than we are. They, they are willing to do things that we, for moral reasons or whatever sensitivities are not willing to do. Um, they are willing to steal people, steal ideas, uh, very with a state funded, you know, geopolitical behemoth of money behind it. Uh, and they're doing that. So, you know, we, we are, you know, there's a reason why in every one of our QEDC board meetings, uh, the head of, you know, one of the heads of uh, FBI counterintelligence is in there with us at every board meeting and warning us about what we say and do and everything, because they are doing things that we would not be willing to do. We are legally, as a country, prohibited from doing those things. No U.S. intelligence agency can collect proprietary information to make Google richer. In China, you can do that. Here in the U.S., we actually made these tools free from Crypt. Uh, we run an air gap network at Crypt because there's no way to protect your network infrastructure and your secret sauce if it's connected to the internet. It's just not possible. And so we've made those tools available to other people to use. And you can even use these over the internet. We can do full quantum secure one-time pad encryption of your data, publish it on a website. They can harvest it, it can never be decrypted. And that's the kind of systems that we worked on in the US government that have never been broken and are mathematically proven to be unbreakable. Even in this NIST competition that we're in right now, we only believe these algorithms are strong and durable over time. But there's no reason why somebody can't find a break in them tomorrow, and then we have to transition to one of the other ones. And that's, in fact, part of the message today is that be crypto agile, be ready to move on at any moment. I think if you're a multinational company and you are in the West, uh, get really good at doing this and, and start building your infrastructure, start building your people uh, to be able to take advantage of this, or your Chinese competitor will win. Yeah. Full stop. Your, kid, your kids will be working for Huawei, for sure. Eddie, this has been a phenomenal discussion, and I think where this has led at the very last uh, few minutes, I think maybe an idea for a third quantum uh, discussion on ethics, compliance, security of the entire industry, uh, and what just preceded that in terms of uh, global competition in the essential need of quantum for the next leap forward in industry and development. Uh, uh, if uh, anyone has a final comment among the panel, uh, Denise and uh, Eddie, uh, please do. And then uh, I would like to thank the audience for uh, being with us for an hour and a half plus. It was a tremendous discussion. Uh, Reed, do you have uh, any final comment? I think I, I alluded to it during the conversation, but from, from where we sit at the engine, uh, the success of, of quantum computing, both hardware and software and, and the applications of it uh, really could be at the heart of, of a fundamental set of true world challenges, food security, energy, uh, climate. And, and it's, it's exciting to be able to be helping many different teams make progress against that because i think it is essential for our kids and grandkids future yeah. Yeah.
Uh, Dennis, you had a lot to say in the last few minutes. Anything I, more? I don't want to dominate the conversation, but you know, the you know, I'm on out spent a career on the dark side working in the intelligence community, seeing this happening all around the world. And it's unsustainable. And we've had lots of our leaders, including some from the Bureau, uh, NSA, DOD, and so on, come out and explicitly tell everyone, you are responsible for your own data, your own infrastructure. It's the national economic security imperative for this country. We cannot sustain more IP loss, data theft, and everything else that's been exploited for the last 10 years. That can't go on for another 10 years. So at a minimum, you don't have to use crypt tools, use anything that you can that's publicly and easily implementable to protect your data and your company ultimately. Thank you, Chris. No, I'd just repeat that. I think there is an existential threat here. There really is, and we're losing it. If you look on the long term, people are playing the long game, and we're not. Um, the long game has to include basic math and science, stem cells in all of our schools. In including and probably especially inner city schools where they get almost zero and, and raising that standard. That's how we're going to survive as a country. And if we don't do it, we will lose. And all of the things that we want about, you know, our society and equity in society, blah, blah, blah. Look at China. Okay. Uh, that's what we're going to become. And we're going to be underneath that um, boot. So that you know, requires changing in philosophy and thinking and, and, and how we go about doing public education. And that's a pretty big statement to say, you know, um, but I think our ability to teach our children basic STEM skills is hugely important here. And we need to do that over the entire country and especially in, in communities that are being underserved right now. Uh, we need to raise everybody up because, okay, they can't do it and, and giving up on them is not an answer. If we do that and we just give up and say, Americans can't do math, they can't do science, especially in inner cities where most of the pop new population, immigrant population is coming in, uh, we're screwed. I can't agree with you more. A few years back, I attended my son's geometry class in high school, and this was a good high school, and they didn't do proofs. What's geometry without proofs? It, I, it I don't blows think your I mind. As someone who did my PhD in Japan and I saw the people coming out, I was I went to really good schools here. I went to a really nice Catholic high school that you know, gave me A, B, and B, C calculus. That was middle school math for everyone over there. I was catching up. Okay, so, and we all know this at MIT, right? Look around you. Um, how many of the PhDs at MIT are uh, really from the US and were homegrown? Mm -hmm. Very small mm -hmm. minority. And that's what is MIT care. doing in quantum? Uh, a lot of great programs uh, and a lot of the great professors on our advisory board and others, you know, Will Oliver's lab was there at the Lincoln lab from the very beginning of the first qubits being there. And there, there are a lot of uh, really good laboratories. Peter Shore is there. Uh, uh, you can take courses from these people online with the X program there. And I encourage people to do that. If they want to get a um, background uh, in it. So, and, and so there are many people and great interns coming to our company and other companies from there. So it's, a, it's yeah, very active in, in all different areas of theory and practice. And I'll just mention as a final note that there is a really great organization called Qubit by Qubit um, that works with high school students and younger students to help them start an entree into quantum computing. Uh, right now they're having uh, signups for their summer programs. So if you know any high school students and want to encourage them. This is just a phenomenal program. And then finally, I'll say that this uh, event is happening at a very good time. Uh, on, in two days, it will be Quantum Day in the US. So you also will be hearing a lot about quantum computing on Quantum Day. And I think there'll be a lot of uh, positive press about some of the different organizations that are around that help people get into quantum and learn about quantum and support them through their education. Nice. Is there a website for Quantum Day? Actually, Cubit. I don't know. Cubit by can, Cubit. I'll put, Cubit. I'll put, yeah, Cubit by Cubit. I'll put that in the chat. Yeah. Well, great. Eddie, any final comment? No, I know it's, 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 been a, it's been an honor talking to you all, and, and it's, uh, I really enjoyed this, uh, this, uh, this event. I learned a lot, and uh, with a special to thank 
Denise with her with her contacts. So she she helped. Yeah, lots of her. And um, <clears throat> and I uh, would like to conclude this event. And um, Larry, thanks for coming on board and help help out the uh, the introductions and and uh, thank you all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Adel, Denise, Eddie, and audience. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye now.